My name is Joe Cernick. I'm a member of the faculty here at Lindenwood University, and I'd like to welcome you to Insight. Now, Insight is a show where we usually discuss books on politics, both domestically and internationally, uh, sometimes historical books that provide some sort of a perspective on the present, and sometimes broader atmospheric or trend analysis that sort of put political developments into a broader perspective. Uh, today's book is on uh, international affairs, or more specifically, sort of the South China Sea region. It's written by a man named Robert Kaplan, and the title of the book is called Asia's Cauldron, the South China Sea, and the End of a Stable Pacific. Now, joining me on the show today are three Lindenwood University students. To my immediate right is Jesse Bassler. To Jesse's right is Tanya Contreras, and to Tanya's right is Kyle Kisner. Now, I wanted to read an opening quote from the book, and then we'll use that as a starting point to discuss the book. The uh, author writes, This report is about China's growing influence, but I must not lose sight of India's presence in this part of the world. The shadow of China presently looms large. But if at any point very soon China falters, the China South China Sea may once again live up to its French colonial description of Indochina, where China competes on an equal rather than a dominant footing with India and other powers. Ironically, the United States fought against the prospect of a Vietnam united by a communist North. But once that unification became fact, the Vietnamese state became a much greater threat to communist China than to the United States. Well, I definitely think going into this, how China is such a superpower in this Pacific region, especially in the South China Sea, they view most of the South China Sea as their unspoken territory. And because all these countries in the area are waterlocked, it's difficult for them to assume military action against each other without the intervention of maritime um, excellent. And because India is such a power in its own right, China is kind of fearful that their new developing power is going to falter to those or Vietnam. And Vietnam is currently working with India and the other countries surrounding as kind of a threat to China, which is just increasing tensions amongst the area. At the end of the day, the final part of that statement makes perfect sense because if you think about it, it doesn't matter who you're colonized or unified with because at the end of the day, every country is essentially for its own power. And Vietnam, right now as it stands, is one of the only few countries who has the economic ability, political power, and the location, location, location to possibly even uh, try to gain power through the uh, South China Sea away from China. And so it makes perfect sense that even though China unified this region or the Soviet Union unified this region, that it would still try to find ways 50 years later to gain political power within the area. Just as uh, these two actually already identified, China's dominance is compared in this book to how the US kind of rules over the Caribbean in a, a terms of being an economic leader and also just with the policies, the foreign policies that they push. The uh, South China Chi, so if we're looking at it, we've got China and then we're coming around to Taiwan and then you're coming around to the Philippines and then you're going to come down this way. So now we're going to deal with Indonesia and Malaysia and then up here, so in the corner, but in the Gulf, is going to be uh, Thailand, and then Cambodia, and then Vietnam, so that this is sort of, it's sort of like there's a circle more or less, and so this is what you're looking at, and um, you're trying to figure out uh, what is China's role in this whole thing, and it's sort of a central point of the book. Yeah, I believe that China is very paternalistic over the South China Sea. They view it that they have the strongest South hold in it. Their citizens even call it their own blue soil. So they have a lot of power over this area because they are a huge superpower of the globe. But these other countries are very trying to be independent of them because they also use the South China Sea for economic and maritime um, developments. And the issue is that because these countries are all interconnected around this sea, the straits that they use for um, quote-unquote choke points, 
for economic travel, for social travel, and for military action all kind of thrive against each other. So there's this weird kind of battle over who has the right to this area, where are the borders locked in at, and is China the one who can dominate the entire sea, and will those other countries allow that? Well, it's actually interesting because Vietnam, Malaysia, and the Philippines actually have official claims of control over parts of the South China Sea, which actually China doesn't have officially restricted control of the South China Sea like these three countries do. It was actually established to the sea, uh, because of the Sea Treaty, um, and essentially it tells you what areas of the water you can actually claim as your own. Um, but what we're seeing right now is that China actually has so much influential power that their goal isn't even to go to war with any of these areas. Because the point of um, having power within this region isn't who has the more um, naval ships. It isn't about who is going to last longer in war. It's about who can essentially succumb their opponents to not even want to go to war because they know that they'll be completely obliterated. And what we're seeing right now is that China is slowly but surely building up their military power to get to that point to where war wouldn't even be a necessity in order to gain more power. Yeah, one of the points that he makes throughout the, or in the very beginning of the book, referring to kind of the geographic layout of the region, looking at how China is actually protected by having, or the Asian coast rather, is protected by having substantial bodies of water all around it. Um, one of the references that are made in the book is a reference to the stopping power of water. This, along with the fact that there's been enough technological advances to make the great distance of the Asian continent not so great anymore, has resulted in increase in maritime activity, particularly with their navy. And this is such, this is what makes the seaways that Jesse had referred to, such as the Malacca Strait, such a vital resource. China consumes a good percentage of the oil coming from the Middle East. About 80% of it, I believe, was the percentage that the author gave of their oil comes through the Malacca Strait. So if there was to be any instability in the region, just as Jesse said, the bottlenecks in these areas would create a potentially foobar kind of situation for everybody involved. So they really do rely on the balancing presence of the United States military, in particular the U.S. Navy. Yeah, the Malacca Strait sort of plays prominent because then some of the things in his book he goes into sea power and mm -hmm. how to take a look at surface power versus submarines and he spends uh, some degree of time talking about the importance of how you look at different types of sea power and what's, what it's composed with and so yeah, the importance of this Malacca Strait that you have this route through the Indian Ocean into the uh, South China Seas and then as a result the countries that are so dependent on it and so then he says at times that we always tend to think of the Suez Canal as being important because people hear about it but maybe the Malacca Straits may matter more. I definitely agree that China as a sea power depends on those straits and due to Asia's geography they have to become navally focused especially in militant and trade actions and that Malacca Strait is the third of maritime traffic in the world goes through that strait every day. It's a huge source of energy for trade and if that would possibly be controlled by any of these countries it would basically overcome the entire effects of the militant action. And it can go undetected if there's submarines and that's why a lot of these countries in the surrounding South China Sea are building up their maritime defenses using submarines, uh, they're using reef uh, bases that they can fly planes onto and things like that and so they're kind of building up this military forces but it's an unspoken threat amongst them and the definite focus of that is the Malacca Strait. And one of the issues with trying to build up your uh, navy as to be as strong to compete with one of the top five powers in the world is that it's so expensive to even get a submarine. I think he talks about it, it costs over six million or was it six billion dollars to get one of these warships to even be built without anything included in it. And even the United States, which is like number one in expenditure in military, can't compete right now with the way that the Chinese government is trying to build up its own uh, navy. So what we're seeing right now is that it actually could be potentially a big threat if we aren't spending enough uh, money, time, and resources into building um, stronger uh, militaries in these areas. Well, he talks about the United States that there's been a decline in the number of ships and mm -hmm. the size of the American naval fleets. 
uh, since the uh, Reagan era. And so he was referring to that the number of ships we currently have has gone down significantly. Uh, I guess he was trying to speculate whether we would see some significant increase in the number again. Right. He makes a very he makes very profound uh, declarations that Vietnam, for instance, is very reliant on the military backing that they receive from the military. They were actually one of the countries to which she was referring to that sunk a good deal of money into trying to buy these refurbished Russian submarines that they were going to start this submarine program with. Unfortunately, there's a lot of logistical issues that come along with maintaining those vessels as well as he talks about an entire generational delay before you even have enough people trained up to actually make it an effective thing. But their whole point was to, in, in a sense, I guess, entice more Americans and coalition naval forces to come to the area because they were saying, look, we can secure these islands here and you guys can use those as their stop-off points, which is a bit perplexing as I'm reading this because he, the author goes in to explain that, but they were already doing that to begin with. So it's ironic. He talks about Vietnam and yeah. that Americans see Vietnam and that thinking there's this hostile relationship because we had a long war with them. And he's saying the Vietnamese don't see us as the enemy that it's, uh, they see China as the enemy and that we're, we have a chance of having a closer relationship with the Vietnamese because they see sort of a combination of one, the development of their capitalism system and two, sort of a reliance on needing American naval support. So it's in his whole chapter on Vietnam, it's sort of an ironic twist about how we now look at our relations with Vietnam in a better way than we would sort of assume. Yeah, people would assume that the tensions would be very violent and kind of um, vengeful, if anything, just because of the conflicts of the Vietnam War and the past of that and our kind of interference with their development. So the country is kind of contingent on if there's going to be a military action with China, they would assume we would help them just because of our development and our positions in Vietnam. Vietnam is blooming at this point. They're developing energy plants and things like that. They're bumping up their military, and the issue is where U.S. stands in that kind of position. Do we help these, this country out in developing um, against the military action that's possible in China, or do we stand back and kind of assume a neutral position in that area? He uh, referred, I think, in the case of Vietnam to them looking at developing uh, offshore uh, oil. And so as a result, that, that might be a eventual tension point. And so I guess you're trying to figure out how far out to the South China Sea do you go to drop oil wells and then sort of see what's out there. Um, and again, I know from other things I've read, they always sort of talk about oil deposits, but then uh, all of these sort of have a great deal of speculation whether or not there's a lot of it there or not as much. But in either case, that that's the sort of thing that can create tensions because now you've got oil drilling out in the uh, seas. And if that's the case, and that definitely pushes uh, the United States, like, it gives more incentive for the United States to definitely intervene within the region more than it already is. Uh, however, because it's a lot of speculation, it's really hard to say exactly what the United States should do in the situation. But I think that either way, what the United States definitely doesn't want is it definitely doesn't want China to get an absolute uh, power over the South China Sea. Um, and so in the end, even though the relationship between Vietnam and the United States does seem to be a little paradoxical, um, in the grand scheme of things, it makes perfect sense that Vietnam would seek the United States for their uh, naval fleets because it's not going to be able to take on the, re the uh, South China Sea all on its own. The way he looks at China versus Taiwan so he says, China, by way of its 1,500-mile short-range ballistic missiles focused on Taiwan, and its 270 commercial flights a week to Taiwan, will be able to do an end run around Taiwanese sovereignty without needing to subdue it through a naval invasion. China's effective capture of Taiwan in the years to come will allow Chinese naval planners the ability to finally concentrate their energies on the wider South China Sea 
an antechamber to the Indian Ocean, in which China also desires a naval presence in order to protect its Middle Eastern energy supplies. Hence, again, that idea of how do you extend your naval reach. So it's sort of the way he's trying to see that there is the possibility for as they get farther away from the mainland of China and you extend in order to protect this oil line, then you're, uh, that's when I think he's suggesting there may be potential problems uh, arising. Well, he refers to most of the conflict that's occurring being there's tension due to a lot of these warships having interactions while they're out there on the shipping lanes and things. And he refers to the fact that the island chains that, the, that China and Japan and, and some of the other countries are attempting to claim as a part of their geographical l landscape, that there's a lot of dispute over that. Uh, one of the islands actually can't, had about three different, excuse me, there's three different countries that were laying primary claim over one of the reef islands that was uh, viewed as a vital point in the South China Sea for the offshore drilling. Uh, with his U.S. sort of intermingled in there, so he's sort of discussing the notion you had a uh, roughly 600 ship navy in the Reagan years. We now get down today, so it's uh, around 300, and he's expecting it to go down from there because of the phasing out of some older ships. And uh, he's sort of speculating that because of the price and the cost overruns uh, and budget constraints that you're not anticipating some massive increase in the number of American naval ships. Uh, and, but he's sort of saying that in contrast to that, what you're going to see with China is they're going to try to develop sort of a niche navy, he calls it, where you're going to try to specialize in the development of certain types of ships. Now, as they develop sort of certain types of surface ships, will we see sort of, again, the reemergence of a focus on other countries wanting submarines, which he sort of sees as maybe needed as a counterbalance to a surface navy. Yeah, I definitely think there is going to be a counterbalance development. We've already seen it with other countries in the South China Sea developing their own navies as China has dramatically increased their militant actions. And because the U.S. has always been seen as kind of the paternalistic defense of these smaller countries with their own maritime involvement, that as that decreases, China's increasing, the other countries are going to be fearful for their own safety, and they're going to counterbalance that by building up their own kind of ships and maritime advancements. Right. Uh, if there's anything that we've learned from the Cold War is that when your opponent gets a bigger weapon, you want to get either an even bigger weapon or more of the same weapon. And so what we're going to see right now is that the same sort of logic applies within the South China Sea. If the United States essentially recedes away slowly but surely from the South China Sea, you're essentially leaving all of these smaller countries exposed. And these smaller countries can either be subdued or they can fight back. And something tells me that Vietnam especially are, uh, is going to try and fight back. And so if uh, we see China getting a large number of Navy vessels, then it makes logical sense that for their own protection, a lot of these countries are going to start trying to put more emphasis on their uh, water powers. And if they don't, well, then, you know, they're just going to lose out on a lot of opportunities in that area. He uh, sort of says uh, you have a problem where he calls it media's distorting mirror. And so as a result, they're going to focus only on this whole region if there's a natural disaster. And now suddenly we're going to pay attention to a monsoon, for example, and its devastating effect. But he says that what you really need to focus on is the naval movements and have a better sense of that. But he says that doesn't appear like that you're going to see that. And I, and I think what he's critical of then is mainly American television, not sort of focusing on sort of some of what he perceives of as going to lead to problems. Well, and if you just look at it from the perspective of the average American viewer, in order to understand the complications of the South China Sea, you have to actually think about it a little bit more. Everybody understands that things like typhoons, monsoons, hurricanes, 
natural disasters are bad. It's easy to understand because it's physical damage. When you get into the world of politics and the intricacies of how conflict arises be between countries within a region, it's a lot more difficult to understand and it requires a lot more historical background. And as we established within our last session, most Americans aren't very bright and don't look for information on their own, at least not in an expert sort of way. And so I think that's why news, which is created to adhere to the layperson, not to the expert, usually focuses on things that are very easy to grasp, like natural disasters. He, uh, which again, this Vietnam, I sort of thought it was interesting. So he's saying America is still suffering a serious crisis of confidence following the debacle in Vietnam. But then what he says is Vietnam looms large in America's uh, future. Once again, the Vietnamese are pleading for America's help. And so sort of an ironic twist, you might say, on uh, again, how Americans are not looking at Vietnam, but he's saying you've got to pay attention to this. Right. He talks the, the, pretty much the typical American reference to Vietnam you see a lot of the times is either as a bitterness towards the Vietnamese, perhaps from some who were very supportive of the efforts, but in general he kind of points to the so-called liberal left interpretation of what happened in Vietnam, that it's very negative, very disillusionment with the government oriented, whereas the Vietnamese having a 2,500 year history, most of which was, has been occupied by China and resisting their rule, uh, we are actually just a very small blip on that radar. And when we went to Vietnam initially, there was substantial call from Viet from Vietnam to receive aid from us, and this is similar to what we're seeing now in terms of they need America to help prop them up economically. We need Vietnam to sort of take the reins a little bit more in the South China Sea as American uh, agendas and foreign policy is shifting a little bit. We're not fighting the Russians in the Cold War anymore. We're fighting the abstract concept of terror. He uh, was saying what, what he saw with the Chinese was one of their developments for their naval power was they were trying to figure out how to blind American satellites so American satellites couldn't sort of then pinpoint where uh, Chinese naval forces would be located on any of the seas and then from that the Chinese were sort of looking at the development of ships with cruise missiles that could then uh, be aimed at sort of American forward bases so that he this is why he was sort of seeing potential developments in how you're looking at well what can happen from a naval point of view but at the same time he talks about the idea that the seas allow you for time to sort of have some degree of peace because of distance. And he mm -hmm. talks about sort of the distance from China to Taiwan is still four times the distance as that between sort of France and uh, England over the English Channel if you're going back to look at the Second World War. Yeah, it's very different trying to conquer and occupy an island that's a good distance on the water away from you he actually refers to he doesn't think that it would be very likely that China could hold Taiwan for an extended period of time because eventually they have to their ships have to pull back and and head towards the mainland at some point but again what he's doing is from this he's trying to speculate we don't know what China really wants yet right. but this is sort of what he's saying is because of the need for these natural resources we have to be aware they may be looking at their vulnerabilities. Yeah, as the tensions grow in this area, it's all based off speculation. There's no direct threat yet. There's just minor threats such as the satellite interference or the increased military um, composite. And that fear kind of drives people. The tensions are growing. That's going to make things worse as the conflict grows and China develops their entire regime as they want to control the South China Sea. And the issue with this development not being clear cut is that it's going to be difficult for the U.S. to decide when to interfere and to what degree. Even though Vietnam is wanting our help against China, if there was to be a military conflict, we have no idea when that's going to be or what's going to arise in that situation. It's purely speculation. And this is something that you really just have to play by ear. I mean, nobody's really a fortune teller. And even um, the author, Robert Coplin, who is 
written quite a few extensive books mm -hmm. on Asia specifically. Um, and even he doesn't know exactly what's going to happen. So I think really at this point all you're left with are speculations because it's so unpredictable at this current time. Well, and that's why he's, he's trying to give you some sense. These are things that you want mm -hmm. to be able to think about because he's talking about the idea that if we take a look at China, for example, we see their uh, military spending increasing. Mm -hmm. uh, he's talking about the idea that they're sort of moving in the direction of spending more time trying to have military buildup, and he's sort of contrasting that with what he sees in the United States. Uh, and as a result, he's trying to figure out, well, what's going to happen? Because after all, they need these resources, and so will they become concerned? And, and there's some of it, it seems to be not aimed against the United States, but it's more aimed against Vietnam. And so but Vietnam seems to be the crux, although he spends time talking about other countries in the region. You sort of get a sense from the book that it's Vietnam that is a potential problem for China and whether they have Vietnam in mind as they're making these plans uh, and trying to figure out how do they do this. Yeah, I definitely think throughout the book he draws very strong points on the liberalist perspective and in international theory and how these multipolarity countries are going to interfere with one another. And I think while the book does have a ton of detail, a ton of information about the issues in the South China Sea, I think it does require a little bit more research, a little bit more historical knowledge of how intense this militant action is going to be, how these different countries come into play, and especially where the U.S. stands in these interferences. Are we going to be the paternalistic um, defender of the smaller countries? Are we going to stay neutral because it's going to affect our military and our economic spending and possibly put us into conflict with China, a global superpower that we might not possibly be able to take on? We only have a few minutes left. Uh, what do you think of the book? Do you recommend it to the viewers? Um, I would definitely recommend this book if you're interested in military action, if you're interested in international relations. For a typical layman, it might be difficult to understand just because it does throw a lot of information at you very quickly. Um, but I think it does effectively represent the international relations that we have with China and the South China Sea, and it fairly represents every country's um, personal opinions in the area and what they want to see develop over time. I would certainly recommend this book for anybody who is interested in international relations or in political science. Um, I would suggest that when you read this book, you definitely have a map in front of you, mm -hmm. or perhaps that you go on YouTube and look up different um, actual lessons that the author has given to multiple uh, different classes. It is definitely helpful in understanding the complexities of the region if you are interested in that, but I, as Jesse said, I don't think it's your typical uh, layman book. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally would recommend it too. It was very in-depth, very informative. He goes over the history of these different regions very pretty extensively in a short amount of time. And it definitely shows the contributing factor. For example, he kind of makes the point that the during the Opium Wars, the treaty ports that China had for Western powers, a lot of what they're doing now is kind of as a response to not being hampered in those ways. So it, it gives you an interesting view on how exactly the global economy is shaping up. And, and as she said, yeah. if you're a foreign policy person, that's definitely a good read. I want to say this is a good thing. Good. Thanks for joining us today.